رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله على نعمة القرآن الحمد لله على نعمة السنة الحمد لله على نعمة الزواج All praises due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon all those who follow in his footsteps until the day of judgment. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his innumerous blessings that he has bestowed upon us. And the greatest of these blessings is the blessing of the deen of al-Islam. And we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of al-Quran. And for the blessing of the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for the blessing of marriage, as zawaj My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, we will now begin our journey into some of the tips or some tips that we have gathered that will cultivate happiness and success within a relationship. Now, the way we need to view our relationships is like a garden. If, with regards to gardens, if we don't water them, if we don't fertilize them, they will not produce any fruit and vegetables. Likewise, both the husband and the wife must be planting the seeds that are going to produce, that are going to cultivate this happiness and success within a marital relationship, within this union, within this bond, within this institute. The more stable and the more happy you are in your homes, the more, the more happy, the more productive you're going to be outside of your homes. So you're going to see yourself working better at work, performing better at, at the school, at the university, at the college. So you will also have the strength to do better dawah, to call people to Islam. So there are many, many benefits that come about just from being happy within your home. It is very vital and important to be happy within your home. You deserve that. That's your right to be happy in your home. Do you think, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that the Sahaba, that the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were able to achieve so much and to spread the word of Islam throughout many parts of the world and excelled in many areas and contributed to so much that Islam has contributed to humanity whilst having problems in their houses? Do you think that is the case? La wallah. An unhappy family creates disaffection, it creates pain, it creates frustration, and it gives rise to crushed personalities. That's what's going to happen. People are going to be confused with these crushed personalities. Distortion in the family is going to give rise to distorted personalities. Young people that are raised in unhappy families can turn out to be a dangerous threat to society. And we see it. Dysfunctional families what they do is they rob children of their happiness. And families are the building blocks of a society. The more functional a family is, the better and the stronger the society is going to be. So 
A house, for example, that's filled with problems does not allow the members in this household to worship Allah in the way that he should be worshipped. So a person, for example, is deprived from ha being able to pray correctly or to recite the Qur'an and to ponder over its meaning. The happiest people are those who are happy at home even if the people outside the home dislike them. And indeed the most miserable of people are those who are unhappy at home even if all the people outside of their home, they make them happy. Why? Because all that he or she will be thinking about is that in the next few hours I will go home and relax and be happy. Even if everyone hates them. They know that they're coming to a place they can find this sakina. They can find this atma'nina, this rest. But on the other hand, the person who has problems at home wishes there were more hours in the day that will keep them away from their home. So, for those of you who are already married, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I pray that if you apply these tips that we are going to go through, that inshallah you will see a transformation in your relationships as early as today. As today or overnight. Because it doesn't take a lot of work. There are some things that we're going to see, inshallah, that just require a little bit of work. And you start to see changes within your relationship. So it's never too late, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, to increase the, to increase the love in your life. Let's begin. Number one, compatibility is the starting point. And this is probably the first condition that the scholars of Islam um, stipulate. And this is known as Al-Kafa'a. And we spoke about it earlier, but we are revisiting this point to stress upon the point of compatibility. And then we shared with you a questionnaire to ensure that you are cap you are that the that, that, that the, the opposite spouse is the right one for you. She is compatible. So there are questions that you can ask before you enter the marriage. So compatibility is the starting point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fankihu ma taba lakum min nisa In Surah An Nisa. Verse number three, marry those that please you of women. One of the main contributors towards a marital breakdown is due to the husband having a certain mind frame, living in a certain mind frame, and the wife is living in another world, or another mind frame. If you are already married, then the husband and the wife need to foster common interests. And we'll talk about that later. That will keep the, the flame of love kindling. The second point, the second tip is taqwa Allah. After you found the right one, then fear Allah. Revere Allah. Be conscious of Allah. In hiding and in whether you are in hiding, whether you are in secret, whether you are out in the open. And we find subhanAllah that taqwa Allah is the, 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 the instruction of Allah given to the first of people and the last of people. It's nothing, it's not exclusive to the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And we have instructed and we have instructed those who are given the scripture before you and yourselves to fear Allah. So what does the word taqwa mean? You know, often we look in a book, we look up the word taqwa, or we, we just read, or someone translates as just piety. Any other words that they usually use for taqwa? As a, just a one word translation? 
God consciousness, but it's more comprehensive than that. Taqwa Allah, as uh, one definition given is that by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, when he was asked about taqwa, his response was, have you ever trodden on a thorny path? And the response was yes. So it was said, what did you do on this path? What did you do on this path? He said, I kept away from the thorns as much as possible. So wherever there was thorns, I kept away. And so, so Abu Huraira said, that's what taqwa is. Distancing yourself from the things that are likely to prick you. From the things that are going to hurt you. And as Ali radiallahu anhu, he gave a definition as, as well. He said, a taqwa is al khawfu min al-jalil, fearing Allah. Wal amalu bit tanzil, and acting upon the revelation. In other words, acting upon the Quran and acting upon the Sunnah. Wal rida bil qalil, and being content with what little you have. Wal isti'adadu li yawmir rahil, and preparing yourself for the day of departure. So when you have taqwa Allah, this will actually relieve you from distress and from anxiety. And it's going to help, through, help you through difficult times. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ That whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is conscious of Allah, reveres Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make him a way out. And he will provide him, so in addition to that, Allah is going to provide you with wealth from, from where you least expect it. So we need to fear Allah. And we need to understand, this is a very important point I want to make here, that sinful actions, because that's, that's the opposite of taqwa Allah, whether major or minor, especially if they're minor and they are consistently being done, this is going to lead to hardships in your life. This is going to be the obstacle that's going to come between you and your wife, you and your work, you and your children. You're going to have misfortunes. And the proof, the evidence to what I'm saying is in the book of Allah. In Surah Ash-Shu'ara, chapter 42, verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ He says, whatever of misfortune befalls you, any misfortune that befalls you in your life, any, وَمَا Anything that you find that you're going through difficulty, what, is, what does he say? وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ it's as a result of what your hands have earned. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Yet at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's not holding us accountable for every little thing. He's pardoning. He's letting some things go. There was a brother, I remember about maybe two, three years ago, lives locally. He said to me, Brother Bilal, you know, I've been trying to have children for seven years. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not blessed me with any children. Do you know what this person's job was? He worked in a bank. You know which bank? Of course he did. <laughs> he worked for that bank. And, and you know in which department he worked in? The river bank. The, Huh? The loans department, finance, riba, usury. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? He said, cursed is the one who accepted riba. And the one who paid it. And the one who recorded it. And the witnesses, they are all alike. So the brother said, he repented. 
enough's enough. Okay, I'm earning top dollar, but it's not worth it. He left it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he had certainty that وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ That whoever fears Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make for him a way out. He's going to provide him from where he least expected. Remember we said earlier, it's not about how much you have. It's how much happiness is that, that money bringing you? How much good is it bringing you? So he said he turned and he opened up a small business and he was earning probably a third. A third of what he was uh, earning before. He said, you know what brother, after I began this job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now blessed me with a baby boy. Seven years he's been trying. Because وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا He can't, I, I couldn't, I, I could not afford not to put this tip in. So we need to adhere to the laws of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we want to prosper, if we want to be successful. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever turns away, whoever puts their back towards my remembrance, towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for certainty, for surety, inna lahu ma'ishatan donka. He's going to have a difficult, wretched life. It's inevitable. Sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. And some of the early pious Muslim uh, predecessors of the past, they used to say, Inni la a'asi Allah fa'ara athara thalika fi khuluk, fi khuluk imra'ati wa dabbati. They would say in the past that I would actually disobey Allah outside of the home, maybe in his business or something, and then I would come home or only to find the the remnants or the ramifications of that sinful action in my vehicle, giving him a hard time. So that Toyota, that Beamer is giving you a hard time. And in my wife. So he'd come home and his wife would be at his neck. He'd find that his, prop, his wife is just there giving him a hard time and he would blame that on himself. So ensure that also what is the most important point with regards to taqwa Allah is we need to ensure that we are praying the five daily prayers. Don't ever, ever, ever undermine the five daily prayers in the relationship. You'd be a fool if you undermine salat, if you're not praying. Because in Surah Al-Baqarah, this is a chapter in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses or talks about issues to do with talaq, divorce. And amidst the verses of talaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He throws in a verse for us to contemplate. Not to just read over, but to internalize, to digest it. And to apply it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 238. Hafidhu ala salawati wa salati al-wusta wa qumu lillahi qaniteen. I'm going to say it again. Hafidhu ala salawati wa salati al-wusta. وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Maintain your prayers and in particularly the middle prayer, in other words the Asr prayer. And stand before Allah devoutedly obedient. The Mufassirun, the commentators of the Qur'an, they, they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a hint, a clue. Why would you throw a verse talking about Salat when talking about divorce, because one of the major contributors towards marital problems is not praying. 
and you ask any sheikh, you ask him, has he asked the question to that person that's having these problems, do you pray or not? Nine times out of ten, and I have been one to ask this question, the first question that I ask, Wallahi, and Allah is my witness. When someone comes to me and says, Bilal, I've got a marital problem, my first question to them is, do you pray or do you pray? And nine times out of ten, I will hear, no, we're not, both not praying, or casual, or part-time, or sometimes, or occasions. And then they wonder, why do we have a problem to begin with? Point number three. We need to maintain a balanced lifestyle. There should be a time for your mind. That is, pursuing Islamic knowledge. Ilm. There must be a time for you to purify yourself through Islamic knowledge. You've got to make that time. Time for the book of Allah. Time to read some hadith. There needs to be a time for your body, your mind, your body, your, meaning moderation in food and drink. Exercise, because exercise produces this stimulant. What do they call that in the brain? Your in, uh, huh? Endorphins, isn't it? Happy hormones. <laughs> That's right. You want to be happy. You've got to do the things that are going to make you happy. So, exercise. Your body and your clothes, you need to be clean. So you've got to look after your, your mind, you look after your body. Personal hygiene. And your soul. Performing regular acts of worship that draw you near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we want you to main, a, maintain a balanced life, quality time, and not just a routine life. And in the hadith found in Bukhari, when Salman, he visited that companion, that great companion, Abu Dabda. And Abu Dabda, he was, he was very much committed to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fasting the days, worshipping all night. So when he came to see him, he found Umm Dabda, his wife. She's very dressed in a very shabby way. She's not taking much notice. He said to her, why are you like this? Why are you dressed like this? And she said, Abu Darda, he doesn't have any, uh, he said he's not interested in the luxuries of the world. He doesn't care how I look. So Salman, he gave him a gift. He gave a gift to Abu Darda. And he gave him some beautiful words. And I want you to remember these words. He said, Inna li rabbika alayka haq. Your Lord has a right over you. Wa inna li nafsika alayka haq. Yourself, body, mind and soul, has a right over you. وَإِنَّ لِأَهْلِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقٍّ And your family have a right over you. فَأَعْطِي كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍّ حَقَّ Give everybody their due right. Whoever has a right over you, give them that right. That's what a balanced life is. Not just all work, not just all kids, all the attention to the kids, all the attention is to the spouse, all the attention is to Dawah. No. They need, we need to strike that balance. So, Abu Darda went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He narrated the whole story, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Sadaqa Salman. Salman has spoken the truth. He endorsed the statement of Salman. There needs to be an hour during the, the week, one day in the month, a period once in a while where both the husband and the wife sit together. No children. Mobile phone, switch it off." in which the husband and the wife give each other unadulterated attention. There is this couple that would travel from one city to another city every two weeks. That's their program. Every two weeks we need to travel together. The sole objective, objective from these getaways is purely to communicate with each other. That's it, communication. No radio is allowed in the car. No tape recorder, no CD player. The mobile phone is switched off. What's the program in the car? This long journey going to Wollongong, Newcastle, whatever. The journey, the program is, we're going to talk. We're going to communicate. We're going to iron out the issues. We're going to get closer. 
You get, <laughs> the sister gets, you talk too much. Moderation, my dear sister in Islam. <laughs> Actually, we'll talk about that later. Another man takes his wife, or to be politically correct, they go out together to the beach once, uh, you know, in a once in a while. And what they do, they promise each other not to talk about children or work and its stresses. They said that all we talk about is things to do just between us. So they concentrate on their relationship. A time for just maybe venting, letting out some, you know, some, uh, some problems or issues or just, just, just spending some time together. And so by spending quality time and releasing your internal problems, this prevents problems from arising or uh, escalating. Another story, a man phones a sheikh and he complains about his wife's conduct. So the sheikh arranges an interview. And when they arrive to his office, he listens to both of them. And then they, in front of the sheikh, they begin to enter into a furious debate or, or some argumentation. You know, the voices arise, the nerves, the veins. And then finally, they, they, they actually start to calm down and begin to work things out in front of the sheikh. The sheikh's just sitting there. So next, the wife gets up and she kisses her husband on his head, on his forehead. And the husband kisses her on her forehead and they, say, they turn to the sheikh and they say to him, Jazakallahu khayran. <laughs> for what? That's what the sheikh said. What for? What did I do? They said, you, you reconciled us, you brought us together. He said, I didn't do anything. It was both of you who came to an agreement. So the wife turns to the sheikh and the sheikh Abu Muhammad. She says, Ya Abu Muhammad, if my husband were to spend one hour with me a week, I promise you, we will have no problems. The problem is that he is busy all day and I am busy all day. Then when we come to speak to each other, our discussions end up in fighting and disputes. So we need to schedule a monthly picnic with our families. Schedule a yearly holiday. Put it in your diaries from the beginning. And you need to, you need to commit yourself to it. Commit yourself to what you've put in the diary. Invest in a board game, Islamic trivia games, Scrabble. Why not? Sit and play with your wife and your children. No, not PlayStation. <laughs> we want better games. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he once, we're talking about spending quality time and and scheduling that, those, those moments. He once had a race with Aisha, was out on the journey, he had a race with her. And whilst, when he, 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 he told the, um, the people who was with to go forward, he stayed back with her, turned to her, do you want a race? I'll race you, all right. So they had a race. Who won the race? Aisha. Aisha she beat the Prophet she was young. Then when she grew older and she put on a bit more weight, the Prophet never forgot that race, did he? <laughs> That's how, we, that's how we men are, is that right? <laughs> we'll talk about that as well, inshallah. <laughs> but next time he had a race with her later on. And who won the race this time? The Prophet wasallam. And he said to her, one for one. Now, do you think the Prophet wasallam is really after a challenge or something like that? What's he doing? He's cultivating happiness. Having fun, trying to create that atmosphere of love that we spoke about. So, having said all of this, however, don't get too caught up with loving your spouse and forgetting about Allah. That's another problem. Too much love and then not enough yani commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What this means, brothers, is that when the adhan is sounded, and it's time for, and the time for prayer has come, you need to flee to Salat. So when you hear 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, it means Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So if the wife is sitting down with you and she tells you, yeah, but honey, we're having such a good time and you know, do you have to go? You say to her, this sitting is over. Like that. And now I'm going to go and I've got an appointment with Allah, but I'll be back inshallah to finish off this beautiful sitting. Don't say that word, huh? <laughs> Number four, be open and frank with your spouse. Be open and frank. This is called in Arabic, musaraha. Be open and frank. There is an Arabic proverb which says, as-saraha raha. As-saraha raha. That openness necessitates relief. So, of course, it has its pros and it has its cons. So not, not being open with your, with your partner can actually also lead to internal problems, maybe psychological problems that you may develop or disorders. I'll give you an example. Shortly after their marriage, a husband and a wife, they travel to Turkey for a month. And during the trip, the husband asks his wife about any relationships that she may have had prior to the engagement. So she begins to mention some of her previous relationships with some of her relatives. She didn't commit any major sin, but never, nevertheless, there was something there. So now the wife here, she's not thinking about the impact of these words and how they are being stored in the hard drive of the man. Especially if it's, if it's a Lebanese man, huh? So, he's storing this information. The month goes by and they pack their bags to go to the airport. At the airport, the husband, he sees a customs officer looking at, or for lack of better words, checking out his wife. And he, then he, he sees her, she's looking at him. Allahu alam what that look was. But whilst they're in the airport, he turns to his wife in a very, he's got all this information that he's stored on the hard drive, and he turns to his wife, he says to her, Anti Talik, you are divorced. The bomb. So, there are two types of openness positive and negative. Now, this story that we just mentioned to you is a negative openness. There's no need for her to mention her previous relationship, she's married already. Let's see, they're married, everything's done. Why mention them? Another example of negative openness, this time by the husband, can be seen in the following story. A husband and a wife, they take off to the beach one night for some tea and nibblies. So he's doing the right thing, trying to spend the, some quality time with his wife. They sit on the, on the beach and they begin to reminisce. And the wife, she asked the husband about his studies in America and what it was like when he was studying abroad. He begins to tell her stories. And then the wife asked him about any relationship. Did he have any relationships when he was studying? So the man says, I used to know a woman in America. And I remember this woman once, she was wearing a dress with a red rose on it. A dress with a red rose on it. He said, I wish I never, ever, ever mentioned that to her. He said, and he goes on, he goes, it's been two months and every time she wears a new garment, she says to me, who looks prettier? <laughs> me or the woman with the red rose? He says, I regret ever telling her that story. So, this is another example of negative openness. In terms of the types of openness, we have, for example, direct and straightforward. Direct and straightforward openness. Most of the time, uh, this type of openness can be yani, more negative than positive. I'll give you another story. A mother 
tells her son about her disliking of his wife. The wife has an inkling, has some inkling that her mother-in-law is not very fond of her and that her mother-in-law, she you know, speaks about her to her son in absence. What happens sometimes is that the husband and wife, they enter into a dispute. And the wife hurls out, she says, she doesn't know for sure, but she says, I know your mum doesn't love me. And so, she, and so what does he go and reply? He says, yeah, you're right, my mum doesn't love you. Straightforward, he's being straight. It's the truth, isn't it? So these truthful words of the husband causes the wife now to break down. This is not type of... This is not one of the openness that we want. So this, this strategy was not correct. Another one, another, another type of openness is what they call beating around the bush. Another example of this, the husband goes away. And when he comes back, he uses words which are vague. So words that can give rise to suspicious thoughts. So even though the husband may be innocent, the wife begins to be suspicious every time he's away. Why? Because his approach is not correct. He's always not very clear about his actions. He's not transparent. Some cases of divorce have come about through these two approaches that we've just mentioned. Being too direct or, being, or beating around the bush. The third one, the third, uh, the third one is silence. When you don't say nothing at all. An example, the husband says, the husband says uh, saying to his wife like, words like, it's not your business. He's not saying anything about what's concerning him or a particular issue or matter. It doesn't concern you. Don't get involved. So not saying something about certain issues also has a negative effect on the relationship. The fourth type is dialogue. This is what we want now. The fourth type of openness, dialogue. As soon as the wife talks to him about anything, the husband should respond and converse with respect. Without the use of provocative words and phrases that are likely to exasperate the situation. Without any mockery of each other. The number one, listen to this brothers. The number one complaint from women is... Here's what tell me. Yes, what was it? Exactly. I don't feel heard. I don't feel that I'm being listened to. So men need to practice the art of listening to their wives. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us how many ears? Two. How many mouths? So we need to listen twice as much as we speak. That's, where, that's what we've got to do. A, a woman... <laughs> a woman... does not want to be heard. She wants to be listened to. Just because, my dear brother in Islam, you can repeat what she has said, it doesn't mean you have listened. <laughs> Repeating the words doesn't mean you've listened to her. It, I'm spilling the beans, huh? Oh, you wait for later on, guys. And the sisters. This is just the beginning. It just means you've heard. So when a woman says, I don't feel heard, what she means is, this is the interpretation. Can you show me some interest in what I am saying? If your wife comes to talk to you and you are reading or watching the television, put down what you are reading, switch off the television and give her your full attention. When listening to her, reassure her also. You want you to reassure her that you are interested by responding. You can. Respond by little things like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You still respond. Don't just sit there and say nothing at all. You know, if, if you don't want to listen to her, we're, not, we're, telling, we're telling you to listen, but if you're not going to, at least go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh-huh, yep, etc. But we don't recommend that. 
Okay, number five. We have to be very quick because we're going to be running out of time otherwise. Number five. Understand the psychology of the opposite gender. I think this is probably one of the, the main points, and that's why we've highlighted it in the program. Understanding the psychology of the opposite gender. Because yes, men and women, they communicate very differently. And that is something we absolutely, we need to remember when we're dealing with one another. The more we discover and understand the differences, the less resentment and mistrust, mistrust you're going to have towards your spouse. <coughs> Many times we expect the opposite gender to be more like ourselves. We want them to want what we want, feel the way we feel. So what ends up happening? Friction, conflict, maybe divorce. A man by the name of Dr. John Gray has written a book entitled, Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. He compiled this book after questioning some 25,000 people in his relationship seminars. You know, some people, they probably refer to this sort of study as a pseudo-psychological study. Nevertheless, he's got some very, very good points. A recommended reading. Of course, when a, when a non-Muslim writes something, you can't believe everything they say. You have to be careful. But it's still a very good book to the extent that they've actually translated it into the Arabic language. They can give it to your mum and dad if they don't read. Huh? I actually saw it on an Islamic website. It's called Ar-Rijalu Min al Marikh. Men are from Mars. Wa Nisa'u Min Al-Zahra. That women are from Venus. This book, you can even borrow, you don't have to buy it. Save some money. This book speaks about the differences between men and women in many areas. And it offers pretty much a simple solution that couples must acknowledge and accept these differences before they can develop their relationships. Dr. Gray highlights some of the key differences between men and women. So when one understands these differences, better relationships can be built with more realistic expectations. There's more forgiveness. There's a less chance of a relationship actually leading to a divorce. When men understand why women act the way they do and why they expect certain things from the men, from the man, they can more readily accept them for who they are and the same is true for the women. But what encapsulates the study, the research, the analysis, conceded, conceding that men are different to women, are the concise words of Allah, revealed 1400 years ago, which will continue to be recited from that time until the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَىٰ Look at it, three words, that's all he needed. And the male is not like the female. Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 36. And way before Dr. John Gray was born, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Istawsu bin nisa'i khayra. He said, Take good care of women. فَإِنَّ الْمَرْأَةَ خُلِقَتْ مِنْ ضِرْ That the woman was created from a rib. وَإِنَّ أَعْوَجَ شَيْءٍ فِي الضِّلْعِ أَعْلَاهِ And the most curved part of the rib is the upper end. فَإِنْ ذَهَبَتْ تُقِيمُهُ كَسَرَتْهُ That if you insist on strengthening the rib, you're going to break it. وَإِنْ تَرَكَتْهُ 
لم يزل اعوج and if you leave it it's going to remain bent فاستوصوا بالنساء خيرا so take good care of women and the hadith is found in bukhari muslim the upper end of the what, what seems the, the, the interpretation of this hadith is that the up, the upper end seems to be suggesting the head where the thinking takes place Women have a different approach to dealing with the issues that require thinking. Women perceive things differently to men. The way they react emotionally is also different to men. Therefore, the nature of a woman will never totally coincide with that of a man. There's a bend between them. And it may be equally true to say that for, from a woman's viewpoint, there is a bend in a man's nature. So his action will never com completely coincide with hers. Don't force a woman to change some of her ways. Forcing a woman to change some of her attitudes can lead to divorce. In another narration, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ الْمَرْأَةَ خُلِقَتْ مِنْ ضِلْعٍ لَنْ تَسْتَقِيمَ لَكَ عَلَى طَرِيقَهَ The woman was created from a rib. She will not be straight according to your way. فَإِنِ اسْتَمْتَعْتَ بِهَا اسْتَمْتَعْتَ بِهَا وَبِهَا عِوَجٍ That if you want to enjoy her, you will have to enjoy her with that twist. وَإِنْ ذَهَبْتَ تُقِيمُهَا كَسَرْتَهَا And if you try to straighten her, you will break her. وَكَسْرُهَا طَلَاقُهَا And what does it mean to break? And breaking her is divorcing her. And the hadith is found in Sahih Muslim. The husband, he needs to understand the jealous nature of the woman. The jealous nature of a woman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was once sitting with his Sahaba, the companions, at Aisha's house, and the food was delayed. One of the Prophet's wives sent a plate of food to him with a young boy. When the boy got to Aisha's house, what did she do? She hit the plate out of his hand, and the plate broke. Out of what? Jealousy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he picked up the pieces, turned to the companion. He's, it's happening in front of his mates. It's happening in front of the Sahaba. So it can happen in front of your mates. You could be sitting around. Something like that could happen. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Do you know what he said? Who knows what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned and said to the companion. Did he, did, he, did he say, oh, women? Oh, did he? <laughs> huh? What else would, it, would, it, would a typical male say? What would he say? Or he might, he might even tell her off right there and then, right? The Prophet Sallallahu said, غارت أمكم. He said, your mother was overcome by a little bit of jealousy. Your mother, she still remains Ummul Mu'mineen. She still remains your mother, even though she did that. He gave her that respect. He gave her that honor. Even though what she did was wrong, she remains the mother of the believers. So let's conclude this point by saying that we need to understand that men and women are different. They are different physically. They are different biologically. They are different neurologically. And they are different physiologically. Men and women communicate. They think, they feel, they perceive, they respond, they love, they need, and they appreciate differently. As Dr. Gray says, They almost seem to be from different planets, speaking different languages and needing different nourishment. Misunderstandings 
can be dissipated when you remember that your partner is as different from you as someone from another planet. You can relax and cooperate with the differences instead of resisting them or trying to change them. Understanding your spouse's language. Another important point. Studies have revealed that men and women commonly, they misunderstand. This is another, this is another very important area to think about. Men and women they commonly misunderstand, they misinterpret each other as if they are speaking different languages. So men and women seldom mean the same things even though they use the same. I'll give you an example. Women. A woman might say to her husband, you never do such and such a thing. You never take us out to restaurants. True brothers? Huh? What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? Who knows the hadith concerning this point? Yukfirna al-Ashir, when he said that they deny the favors of the husband, and he was talking about most of the women of the inhabitants of the hellfire, uh, women, and, he, and they asked why, they said because they deny the favors of, uh, of their husband, and if you were to do good, and all of your life to her, and you, you have a bad time, she'll, she'll pretty much write off all of that, that, that good times. You never do, you never do such and such. Now, let's, let's, let's understand where the woman is coming from. The, the word never here, as Dr. John Gray says, the word never should not be taken literally. It's just a way of expressing frustration at that moment in woman talk. Men, on the other hand, take expressions literally. We're very literal as males. Huh? Are you, are you guys agreeing with me with this or not? Or are you going to just send me a, a, a note yesterday and just a, 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 like a note and tell me off or something? <laughs> Women, they, they tend to use more like metaphors and generalizations. Men, they're very literal, very straight. They, they, what they say, they, that's it. It's, it's pretty much accurate. So when couples are able to formulate a correct understanding of their spouse's intended meaning, we need to formulate what is the intended meaning, then the response will be more positive and the less arguments will take place. That's all I want to mention about this particular point. I mean, we can probably dedicate, I mean, people have dedicated books and research and psychology, the whole, there's a whole faculty, but I don't have the time. So inshallah, let's move on to point number six. We need to finish inshallah. Don't say anything during extreme anger. Don't say anything during extreme anger. Don't make any decisions when you're angry. Because what this does, it paralyzes your thinking. It paralyzes your thinking when you're angry. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he prohibited a person from passing judgment when they're in a state of anger. Even if you're a judge. If a judge, he's, if a judge is, act, if a judge is ang uh, angry, he's come to the, the courthouse and he's, very, he's not allowed to Islamically to make a ruling. Because his, his thinking is not straight. <clears throat> An important point needs to be made here, and that is men and women cope with stress differently. Men, they tend to pull away and they think silently to themselves about what's bothering them. Do you agree with me, guys? You know, you sort of pull away, you just have a think about it. Women, on the other hand, what do you think, that, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to talk. Huh? They're going to keep going, huh? <laughs> Women, on the other hand, feel there's a need, a burning need to talk about what's bothering them. So women need to understand that when a man goes quiet, huh? it doesn't mean he doesn't care about you. It doesn't mean that he's ignoring you. Or what you have to say is not important. Or that he doesn't love me anymore. 
They must understand that men, they turn dumb in some situations because that's how they process their information. So why does a woman imagine the worst? This is an important point. Why, why does a woman imagine the worst when a man goes silent? Do you know why? When a man goes silent, she imagines the worst. As we said, doesn't care, doesn't love me, probably thinking about marrying another, another woman. <laughs> huh? Because what she's doing, she's comparing the man to her state and her way and how she processes the information. How does she do it? You see, when a woman is silent, you, you, it's usually interpreted in woman language from Venus as two things. That the other woman who's silent, because she knows a woman from herself, that when she's silent, she has something hurtful to say. Or when she's silent, it's because she no longer trusts that person anymore. So see, she applies that to the man. So it is for this reason she becomes immediately insecure. Number seven. Point number seven, let's move on. Express your gratitude when your spouse does something for you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man lam yashkurin nasa lam yashkurillah. The one who does not show gratitude, thankfulness towards the people, he is not one who shows gratitude and thanks towards Allah. So, when you see or you hear something good from your partner, then say something. Acknowledge, appreciate, show some thankfulness, say something. For example, she moves the bookcase. You know, women, they like to move things around the house. They always want to bring about a change. Is that right, brothers? Is that right, sisters? Alhamdulillah, everyone's agreeing with me. I'm so happy. So what happens? She moves it to Tamiuna, moves the bookcase, maybe moves the television, moves the fish tank. Okay, one after another. So why don't you say, Yanni, Yanni, why don't you... Brother, Yanni, when you see this, you say to her, Allah, Jazakillahu khayran. You know, Barakallahu fiki. Allah, if only Allah blesses me with another sister just like you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't say that, ya akhi fillah. Don't say that. If you say that, you know what's going to happen, huh? She's going to put the bookshelf on your head. <laughs> so, don't say that, or else you're not going to have a happy week. Okay? So, even if she's on that saddle or the oven you know what I'm talking about right <laughs> if she cooks a meal and you enjoyed it say something if you didn't like it it's better you choose your words carefully so subhanallah nobody ever heard from Rasulullah the words like the Prophet if he did not like his food he just didn't eat it he would never, he never like uh, discredited any food or anything like that. He never said, I don't like this food. He ate the food that he liked. If he didn't eat it, he just, if he didn't like it, he just didn't eat it. It was that simple. So, you know, say something good. I want to just um, turn to a little story at the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, during the Khilafah, during the leadership of Umar. A, a, a man, he actually narrates the story that a man came to his house complaining about his wife. So when he reached the, the doorstep, he actually heard <clears throat> Omar's wife screaming at him. He's coming to work out his problems while Omar himself has got problems in his own house. So when he, he comes to the, foot, to the doorstep, he's, he, he's, he turns away. So Omar calls him back. He says to him, come here, why, why did you come for? <clears throat> he said, I came to complain about my, you know, against my wife, or uh, complain about my wife, but I saw that you're the Khalifa and you got, you got these problems in your own wife. You're the leader of the Muslims. So Umar radiallahu anhu told him that he tolerated the excesses of his wife 
for she had certain rights against him. He said, is it not true that she prepares my food? Is it not true that she washes my clothes? Is it not true that she uh, suckles my children? And so she saves me the expense of employing a cook, uh, hiring someone to wash my clothes, and a nurse, though she is not legally obliged in any way to do any of these things. Besides, I enjoy peace of mind because of her and am kept away from indecent acts on account of her. I say, therefore, I tolerate. He said, I tolerate all the excesses on account of these benefits. It is right that you should also adopt the same attitude towards your wife. Subhanallah. A study was done recently in this very country and it was estimated that if you were to hire someone or people to do the jobs that a wife does in the home, what are they? Cooking, hand cleaning, ironing, baby, uh, uh, childcare, huh? Do you know that you will be, do you know how much brother in Islam you will be out of pocket if you were to hire all those people to do the things that the woman is doing in the house? Throw a figure at me. 75 G's, huh? 100 G's. Anyone less than 75? You know what I've got recorded in front of me? I was a little bit more probably generous. I just said 70,000 a year. So whilst the average income of a man, of a male is how much in this country? Average. 40, maybe 50, maybe a little bit less. Maybe let's say, let's say 35. So, so how much is the woman? How much is the woman worth? Double that. So, next time, dear sister in Islam, next time you go and fill out an application form, and it says, uh, "What is your job status or what do you do?" The next time you write housewife on the application, I want you to write it with pride, because you are worth more than your husband. I've got some good points already now. I can move on now. Okay. Uh, three more points. Three more points. Very quickly. Wrap it up. Compliment number eight. Compliment to the detail. Compliment to the detail. Especially when complimenting your wife. It's not enough to just say the food was nice. You can't just generalize. Okay. You need to get down to the specifics. If the wife, for example, has dressed up for you, it's not sufficient to say you look nice, darling. You've got to go down to the details. You've got to compliment the, the dress, compliment the, 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 the lines, the, the rose, have the earrings, the, oh, mashallah, the shoes, wow, subhanallah, wallah, you've got good taste in, uh, in shoes. And even down to the nitty gritties, you've got to compliment. So some people, subhanallah, they're very good at speaking to their friends and colleagues outside of the house. But when, subhanAllah, uh, and they've got like these two meter tongues, but as soon as they get home, it's like someone has cut their tongue. Number nine, praise your partner before you criticize them. Put yourself in their position. If you see something in your spouse which is wrong, you have a duty to advise her or advise him. Don't be one of the two types of shaitan. There's a shaitan, a speaking shaitan, the one who goes about using their mouth in a manner which displeases Allah. And then there's a mute shaitan, shaitan al-akhras, the one who sees the wrong and doesn't say anything. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever from amongst you sees the wrong action, should change it with what? His hand. And if he's unable to change it with his hand, he changes it with his tongue. And if he's unable to change it with his tongue, he changes it with his heart. He rejects it. Okay? But, but before you do so, advise, before you advise your partner about something, okay? Because no one, no one likes to be criticized. I'll tell you that. We all know it. No one likes to be criticized, no matter who you are. You don't want to be criticized, okay? So before you do, just say something nice. Just say, you know, say some nice words. But, which brings me to the last point for this module, point number 10, but don't use the word but. Say something nice, but don't use the word but. So the word but, what it does, if you say something nice and then you go but, what you've done is you've destroyed what came before it. Okay? 
For example, don't say like, don't say things like, that dish you cooked was delicious, but I didn't like the salad. Okay? Wrong. You may have well told her that you just don't like the whole meal. That's how it is. In, that's how these uh, Venetians <laughs> interpret things. So, another way you could say it, probably is like, that dish that you made, it was yummy. It was scrumptious. And words to that effect, I would really love it if you can put more of that dressing in the salad. You see? You said it in a different way. These are the words I want to leave you with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. We'll see you back all inshallah for module 5. Wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.